Good afternoon, Extended MMA Universe. It's your boy Jack Slack, and we're recording this on a dreary Wednesday morning. But we've got some good fights to catch up on. Um, we've got Rising this weekend for all your freak fight needs, and some weird news, just the sort of news that makes me uh, remember what a rinky tink stupid sport fighting is generally. Um, but that's what makes it so fun. We've been doing this silly bollocks for 200 years, and it is still as silly as when it started out. So let's kick it off with some news, uh, just to get across how weird the, the week has been. Henry Cejudo was hurt in a house fire, somehow involving Barry Bonds. Um, originally, he was reported as having a broken ankle, uh, so the Sergio Pettis fight was assumed to be off. Apparently, he was just burned, but he will be fighting Sergio Pettis. So... Um, Classic strange Ebbermé story. And uh, reportedly he lost his gold medal, which, if you remember him speaking in any interview before he really was getting serious in MMA, um, it was a lot of his personality that he had a, a gold medal. Uh, I believe it was the alpha male lads used to drink every time he said gold medal uh, or Olympic medal. So kind of sad that that happened. Elsewhere, uh, Daniel Lima, a fighter in Shuto and uh, a lot of Japanese promotions, uh, was dragged onto the, st onto the stage for the weigh-in at the most recent Pancras event, held up by two guys, very clearly would have fallen down if they weren't helping him. Um, awful weight cut, and then goes in and loses the fight by decision. Um, just truly strange, and weight cutting generally has become one of the most disastrous parts of this sport. I mean... It comes up every few months, like, it came up very uh, prominently after the Zhao Cavallo death. Um, I, I mean, I, I wrote a big section of Notorious about that, like, the Irish media were losing their minds. Um, and that's the reason that Charlie Ward ended up in the UFC, because he wasn't going to get another fight at low level uh, in Ireland, uh, because he, he had this reputation as being involved in that unfortunate death. Um, and then this week, Nick Lentz had a really bad weight cut pulled from the fight with uh, Will Brooks. And Kevin Lee, obviously, uh, looked almost dead on the on the scale. Uh, made it on the second attempt, I believe. We say, like, if anything gets someone killed in this sport, it'll be that. But it's already got people killed in this sport. There was that lad down in um, Brazil who, uh, I think he had kidney failure or something like that. Uh, and then there was Jao Cavallo, the Portuguese guy who came to Ireland and uh, and died after a really horrendous weight cut. But it is what it is. Everyone's always going to be working for that extra advantage. Um, you're never really going to be able to cut that out of the sport entirely. Unless you have guys weigh in immediately before going in the cage, which kind of fucks over the promoters if you, um, you know, if, if, the, if you get the guy to the cage and then the fight's called off, you can't really get a last minute replacement together. Though it would work out better for pay-per-view buyers, I imagine. Uh, just a lot of people would feel cheated immediately afterwards. <laughs> and then, perhaps the strangest story at the moment, is that Mark Hunt was pulled from his uh, fight in Australia. I think it was against uh, Marcin Tibura, or whatever his name is. Um, and uh, he was pulled for medical reasons, having passed his medicals. Um, the UFC pulled him for medical concerns. Uh, he has, on the record, talked about various symptoms which, you know, are synonymous with CTE or, or serious uh, dementia pugilistica. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't help that he says things like he's met the Grim Reaper four times in his life or something like that, and, and he's six foot ten and he stands next to him in rooms. Um, you know, he's, he's a guy who's clearly going to have some kind of damage to his brain as the result of getting hit so much and knocked out so often, uh, especially recently, or rather in recent years. Um, but equally it does come off badly that you, the UFC are doing this to him uh, in the middle of his lawsuit against them while they're happy to let um, you know any all, all kinds of old timers who've been beaten six ways to Sunday um, back in the cage to fight again just to get a little bit more out of their name value it's that you know you, you want someone to be protected but you know that the UFC aren't doing this for the fighters' sake. Um, they're doing this out of spite, it seems. Um, you know, we'll, we'll wait until more comes out. Maybe there's something awful on one of his scans or something like that. But um, 
at the moment it just seems petty, but that's the sort of thing that the UFC has historically been famous for. It gets a bit weirder when um, Hunt was replaced at short notice by Vadum, uh, who just fought Walt Harris, was it? Uh, at 216, but didn't really get hit at all. Um, and Vadum had previously said that he wouldn't fight Hunt because he didn't want to go to Australia, because he didn't want to travel far from home uh, now that he's older or whatever. Um, so Hunt got Lewis instead, uh, but now Vadum's going out to Australia to save the car. So it all looks really a little bit... Mm. Final piece of news, uh, Bellator 18. Four, uh, averaged 437,000 viewers apparently, uh, which is the lowest of the Coca era. It's strange they have better fighters than they ever have, and they can't seem to get people to watch them. Um, but more on that later, I imagine, when we get into our uh, rapid fire question round. So, what went on over the weekend? UFC 216 is what went on, um, and it was uh, pretty bloody good, if you ask me, uh, especially considering that, you know, some people considered this like not. Uh, well, a B event, I suppose, because he didn't have the real title on the line in the lightweight bout at the main event, and Demetrius Johnson was fighting not not a tremendously highly rated um, challenger. And then last minute, uh, Fabrizio Verdum lost Derek Lewis as his opponent and then got Walt Harris from somewhere else on the card. Um, and then, of course, Nick Lentz pulled out because he was going to fight uh, Will Brooks. So it took some hits, but uh, it turned out pretty good. Um, on the prelims, or the, rather the early prelims, um, John Moraga starched Magomed Bibulatov, which was uh, an interesting showing. I like Moraga; he's getting better. You know, he was one of the he's one of those guys who's fallen victim to being thrown in with Demetrius Johnson really early. Um, I think he had like three fights in the UFC at that time. No, he'd had two. Uh, he fought Ulysses Gomez and uh, Chris Carriasso, and then he was thrown immediately to Demetrius Johnson, which is just bizarre. But he's had like eight fights since then. Uh, he's lost some to Joseph Benavitez, Matthias Nicolau, uh, John Dodson, obviously. Uh, and the fight against Sergio Pettis, I remember because I quite enjoyed his work during that. Uh, he was actually beating Pettis to the punch, um, but then Pettis would hit him with one or two shots after each time he got hit. Uh, you know, it was that real case of um, admiring your work. Uh, if you... You land, a, you sneak in a really good punch quickly, and then you you stand there congratulating yourself. Um, it's you know it's not particularly uncommon amongst, especially amongst people who are just sort of getting to grips with the striking. You know, if they come from another background. Um, another great example was Vandalay Silva versus Sakuraba, the third one. Uh, Saki's striking looked improved, and he's landing on uh, on Silva, but because every time Silva takes a punch, he just opens up with the windmill, and then Sakuraba gets hit two or three more times. You know? um, but that's what I saw in that fight, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, weird how uh, Moraga was holding his hands, even in sort of exchanging range. He had his right hand out in front of him rather than back by his jawline or somewhere where he could pick it up and obstruct shots. Um you know, I was thinking like jab to left hook or, or hooking off the jab, the sort of stuff that really works well against guys who hang their lead hand out, sorry, their rear hand out there because you can draw their lead, uh, their rear hand one way and then come around the side and catch him on the chin or in the neck. Uh, neck punch, classic, especially the you know it's down the side of the neck. Uh, Fedor used to connect that left hook when he zulu'd guys. He'd always connect it in the side of the neck. Ray Safer was another one who liked to punch in the neck too. Um, not terrifically sporting, but if obviously if you hit a guy in the uh, neck, you can just have them fall down from uh, trauma to the to the veins, uh, loss of uh, what is it? Rapid change of blood blood pressure by trauma to the vein. I I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but it's like the old karate choppy. Uh, if you've ever seen Ricky Dozan, uh, the famous Japanese pro wrestler, really important in the rise of Japanese pro wrestling, or Puro Resu, um, he took on Hidehiko Kimura. Uh, sorry, not Hidehiko, Masahiko Kimura. Um, the Kimura of Kimura fame after he beat Gracie. Uh, Kimura came and did a, a wrestling match and Ricky Dozan, his signature move was the karate chop, uh, like a long shooto, but with his arms straight. Uh, and he, he chopped him for real. He was like, I, I want to stiff him. So he, he chopped him for real in the neck and Kimura went down and uh, he got the pin. Strange dude who was caught up in all sorts of underworld dealings, Ricky Dozan, but a fascinating character. Um, but we've gone off into a, a history story for some reason. Um, yeah, so I, it was interesting how his hand was hanging out there. 
uh, I believe he missed a high a high kick went over the guy's head and he immediately like followed it with a swatting right hand uh, and knocked him down for the finish. Uh, a good finish, you know, and clearly he can hit Moraga, which is quite good. So it's good that he's getting the confidence because, you know, there's a lot of guys in these lower weight classes who could hit, but whereas at the higher weights like uh, 205 and, and above, you, if you crack someone with like an arm punch or a partial punch or whatever it is... Um, you you might hurt them, but at the lower weight classes, you really need to work out how to put your weight into punches, and that re- involves setting it up. And it's a lot harder because those guys at that weight move a lot more and a lot faster than the guys at the upper weights. So basically, you're you're taking more time to set up your punch, but the other guy's moving more. So it, it can be a lot trickier. But enough about that fight because it only went like a minute and a half. One thirty-eight, yeah, literally like a minute and a half. Uh, Pearl Gonzalez versus Pollyanna. Botelho was a really weird fight. Um, Pearl Gonzalez just kept pushing her to the fence and and sitting on the like the double leg position, but was unable to pull her hips out or switch to like a, a high crotch or something like that. Um, and uh, Paulinho, sorry, Botelho uh, just kept raining in elbows to the side of her head. And the ref very rarely broke them. Like he just let them sit there in that position for ages. Crowd hated it. I hated it. Um, I wish we had smarkier crowds in MMA. You know, you just chant, chant like uh, end this match or save us, ref. Um, I think that would have been really fun. But uh, mainly when they get bored at MMA events. I liked when the torches came out for Woodley versus Maya. Um, but also they do the woo, the Ric Flair thing, which they actually brought up on this uh, on this pay per view on the commentary. Uh, Daniel Cormier and John Anik and Rogan work really well together. I'm really enjoying that um, that grouping. Um, you know, a lot of people were upset about the loss of Mike Goldberg, but it, it took a while to, like, find the groove, but this is a really good team. Uh, I do miss Brian Stan, but he's off doing his own thing. But someone was pointing this out to me the other day. The fact that uh, Daniel Cormier is, like, one of the most accomplished fighters in the world and is also happy to sit back and let Joe Rogan talk as the analyst um, really helps. You know, he doesn't pull rank on him ever, and he'll give him... He'll set up his jokes, uh, and he, he just plays off it really well. Um... That guy's got a long career ahead of him in, um, you know, covering this sport as a as a commentator and a pundit um, long after he's retired. Then you had the probably fight of the night. I mean, I, it was my fight of the night, definitely. But then the main and the co-man were pretty good, too. But uh, in terms of all our action, uh, Lando Venata versus Bobby Green was was terrific. Bobby Green is a guy who lost a lot of momentum after that fight with Josh, uh, Josh Thompson. He's got a really interesting style in that he can actually apply the shoulder roll pretty well in MMA and he'll shift stances while doing it um, which you'll occasionally see like James James Tony do um, but he has this problem where he thinks that doing the shoulder roll w- scores him points uh, you know the old saying goes that defense doesn't win fights it just prolongs your career like it keeps you safe keeps you um, lucid in your later stages of your career and so on but it doesn't win fights you've got to actually take offensive action to win fights uh, and he does this thing where he'll like roll off some punches shake his shoulders and go uh <laughs> like, you know make a big scene of how the guy didn't hit him but then the other guy will just throw some more punches and bobby green won't do anything uh, if you're the one who's just def- defending punches all the time you know being de- on defense all the time is basically losing a fight regardless of how good your defense is and I thought that he looked really good in this fight. And then afterwards he came out and said, no, I think the judges are looking for the wrong things. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, Bobby Green, you were doing so well. Um, but yeah, a really cracking fight. Uh, one thing, if you watch it back, I'm going to throw up some GIFs on um, fightprimer.com to go along with this uh, podcast. I think I'll probably put them in the link for the podcast episode on the site. Um, but... Uh, one of the things that was really interesting was that Bobby Green was switching stances a lot. Uh, if you know Lando Venata's style previously in the octagon, uh, every time he's used that low line sidekick as like a probe, and he doesn't like. We talk about um, Yair Rodriguez using it really ineffectively because he leaps in with it, like he pulls it up to his chest to chamber it and slams it down, trying to take out the guy's leg, and the guy runs a mile every time he sees that knee come up. Um, whereas if you watch Venata, he just sort of. He barely picks his leg up at all. He just places it on their knee. Uh, it's really like just reaching out and booping them. Um, and, you know, it's because it's on their knee, it's it's messing with their stance and uh, and annoying them. And you watch things like um, 
Mac Daisy, he puts it on his knee. Mac Daisy breaks stance and starts circling out into that wheel kick. I don't know if that was the plan because like it's a very uh, low percentage idea. Uh, you know, I'll put this on his knee and then he'll circle out towards my wheel kick. But um, it, it just showed that Venata was in position to, to hit after that and he was going into something after he'd done it. Uh, it's just something that he does a lot, just places it there and he'll move in with his next technique um, as an annoyance. But if you noticed in this fight, he threw, I think, one, the whole fight. I think I counted one um, because Green is constantly switching stances. And then if you notice when Green goes southpaw, uh, he'll put that kick in instead. Uh, but he, he, I mean, he uh, loads it up a bit and tries to hit with it. But um, Venata uses it almost not at all in this fight. And that's something that can uh, throw off low kickers, you know, guys who have... Uh, who are aiming for a specific leg and they have that favorite kick or whatever changing the stances can work well equally uh, if you've got a guy and you know he changes stances a lot you can move him into positions where he has to break out and sidestep and kick those legs Um, we'll talk about that with Demetrius Johnson later because it's something I've been saying for years and and it it has worked for previous opponents it's just uh, you know it's part of something that should be built into a game plan I feel like if you go into a fight with Demetrius Johnson and you're not low kicking now and you ask you know moments when you could when you're swinging for his head which just isn't there because of his movement um, those are wasted opportunities where you could have been getting to his legs which are there because he's moving you know Um, but you know that's for later so yeah the uh, sidekick was pretty much shut down by that which was really cool um Venata, his right hand is is money. I someone sent me a question in the in the rapid fire like what would you add to land of Venata? What I'd add is a left hand because his his right hand is money uh, and he lands it from all sorts of places and he does that right hand into the weave which gave uh, Tony Ferguson so much trouble early on but then l- l- put him basically in the snap down for the front headlock later on. Um, but he was throwing right hands and Bobby Green would roll them off the left shoulder standing orthodox and then he'd try and move in on a clinch. Uh, and Venata was doing very, very well, uh, you know, putting the forearm across the neck or the face and then hitting with the right hand off the clinch. Um, exactly what we said Mayweather's so good at. I mean, that's the punch that Mayweather stopped uh, McGregor with. Um, and Bader Harry is also awesome at that. It's a really good time to hit, guys. If you've got them reaching in to, to try and hold you, you know, their hands aren't up by their head. Um, so that was the first knockdown. He, he threw a nice long combination. Uh, Green stepped in. He put his forearm across his face and cracked him with the right hand. And he was looking for elbows on the brakes constantly. He was looking for that right hand every time that Green stepped into clinch. Never caught it as clean as that. Um, and of course, in the first round, there was that uh, knee. I mean, it was a very blatant foul. <laughs> he did hit him with the thigh, which is good, because that would have been a really bad blow if he'd hit him with the knee. Um, but it was totally a, an attempted illegal blow, and he did hit him in the head with his thigh, you know, while trying to knee him in the head while he was on the ground. So, um, you know, I'm always, some people are like, you know, oh, it wasn't a knee on the ground, this, that, and the other. And I'm just like, well, the intention was, and he did get hit and it was a stiff hit. Um, tricky, but you know, regardless, uh, rightfully doctor point. Second and third round, Green really starts to get home with his jab, not just his, uh, orthodox jab, but his southpaw jab as well. And he was doing this really nice thing where he'd, uh, like he wouldn't step back into a, a southpaw stance he'd do like a pivot so his feet stayed uh, so that his like left foot traced an arc like a compass uh, back into a, a southpaw stance and then he'd throw out the jab as Venata stepped onto it uh, which I really liked and then there were a couple of good shoulder rolls where um, Venata threw the big right hand walked past him and uh, Green would jump forward uh, with his southpaw jab and hit him really hard in the head uh, the final flurry of the fight came as he he cracked him hard with that punch. Uh, really fun fight. Uh, came out as a draw, but nobody's really complaining. I mean, it was just a great fight. Lando Venata, I think he's got he's got that star power. Like, well, maybe not star power as in like he's not going to be on Conan and, and he's not going to sell pay per views. But if you see a card and you're looking down at it and you say Land, you see Lando Venata, if you know fighting, you you're thinking that'll be good regardless of who he's against Um, because he doesn't have a very good record in the UFC now what he lost the one to Ferguson but put on an amazing fight lost the one to Tamer put on an amazing fight wheel kicked Mac Dacey you know amazing knockout Uh, and then he he drew this one in an amazing fight so uh, he's got a lot of goodwill with the fans and especially with me I mean (laughs) I'll watch him fight anyone Um, but it just shows that you don't really need to win all the fights to be valuable to the promotion 
I mean, he's not going to get like Conor McGregor money or anything like that, but he will have a place there longer than, um, you know, a lot of these guys who come in and, and lose a couple. But, uh, you know, if, if you're a grinder and you lose a couple, there's a chance you're out on your ass. If you're really entertaining like Vanata and you lose a couple, you should be fine. Unless times get really hard for the UFC. Oh, I forgot to include that in the news. WMEIMG changed their name back to Endeavor. They were originally Endeavor, and then they merged with William Morris, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I really only say this because it set up a nice quip where I was like, probably want to distance themselves from that talent agency that can't produce stars in their own sports league. Uh, you know, just being super bitchy like I like to do, but also kind of true. Cody Stammen uh, shocked uh, Tom Duquinois. Uh, in a split decision. Uh, I, I need to re-watch that one. I can't remember a lot of it. Uh, I was sort of getting hyped for the main card at that point. But Neil Dariush and Evan Dunham had a, had a decent one. Um, and it really, like, they were talking about it on air, but it really did show that, like, if you try for a knockout in the first round and you don't get it, it can be very hard to follow that through into the next uh, next round. Um, Sugar Ray Robinson said some stuff about that in his... Uh, autobiography he was talking about either his fourth or fifth comeback i mean he retired as many times as terry funk um but he uh said like he, he couldn't work out why he was having all these awful fights uh and then his uh his then squeeze or whoever she was might have been wife to be fair um uh, said to him why aren't you fighting like you normally do um you know and why are you swinging us so hard at these guys and then robinson goes oh wait i was trying to knock all these guys out instead of being sugar ray robinson and you know jabbing and counter punching and then if they fall down that's as a result of you know me trying to be sugar ray well me trying to outbox them rather than me trying to knock them out um and you know sugar ray robinson is ranked as one of the greatest punches of all time he could knock out almost anyone and he did it through scientific boxing uh when he was just searching for the knockout even a, a fighter as great as him he couldn't get it a lot of the time i do like dariush um i think he's probably gonna come along i, I think he's got more miles left in him than dunham because dunham you know, there was a little a little while ago when he beat shirk i mean well <laughs> actually shirk that name tells you it was quite a long while ago haven't heard that name in a very long time um awful alec guinness impression but, uh, you know, there was a time where it felt like he was going to break through and it was after that Shirk fight and then it just sort of uh, faltered. Oh, no, he didn't even beat Shirk. He got the split decision. But that was that one where he had him in the super deep guillotine. Everyone was really high on this guy. Uh, he lost a fight to Melvin Gillard and then he struggled in a few more. TJ Grant, Jesus, that is a long time ago. TJ Grant's still MIA. Uh, then he had a rough run. Rafael Dos Anjos, Donald Cerrone, and Edson Barbosa all beat him in quick succession. That is a rough lineup in 2013, 2014, uh, just when those guys are sort of getting to the height of their powers. Um, but he's, he's rebounded with four straight wins, uh, and then this one a draw. So not bad, but very strange that we had two draws on one card. I mean, what are the chances of that? I'm putting together the new primer at the moment, which is going to be about George St. Pierre and um, Michael Bisping, having great fun putting, to get, putting it together. But um, I was watching the fight between Bisping and Belcher, and that was a technical decision. And I was thinking, when was the last time I saw one of those in MMA? Uh, and there were two on the same card. <laughs> it was just crazy. You know, these things. Hang... And there was another one too, wasn't there? Uh, the Bulldog Choke. Uh, the second, bull... the first Bulldog Choke in the UFC, I believe, was Carlos Newton versus uh, Pat Miletic. And then the second one and the third one came on the same night, like 13 years later. Uh, just bizarre how these things happen. Vadum uh, submitted Walt Harris with an armbar pretty easily in a, in a minute, which obviously sets him up to fight again in Australia. Um, good on Walt Harris for stepping in at short notice, but again, heavyweight, anyone outside of the top five, you know, there's a serious gap there in skill. Then in the co-main event, Demetrius Johnson broke the title record, beating, uh, sorry, uh, title defense record, beating Ray Borg uh, in the fight that was moved from whenever it was, a uh, previous event because Ray Borg had the flu or something like that. I mean, no one was expecting Ray Borg to do anything special in this. Uh, his showings up till now had not been mind-blowing. Um, I think the case was that Demetrius Johnson looked as good as I've ever seen him, um, but he was in against a guy who probably shouldn't have been there. Um, you know, there's this thing where we're all like... 
I used to get it every time I wrote a Killing the King, people would be like, well, it's unthinkable. You just don't understand. They're, you know, they're unbeatable. Um, this is why I got tired of writing Killing the Kings. I'd write like Killing the Queen, Ronda Rousey, which I believe was the last one I wrote. But uh, I'd write that. Angry people in internet forums would be like, what? Circling away? You think circling away in basic boxing is going to stop Ronda? Uh, then it happens, and then people go like, oh, no, I knew that all along. And you're like, well, no, because there was a lynch mob when I wrote an article about it. Um, but, you know, Demetrius Johnson is a very, very good fight. Obviously not perfect. There's a, there's a few things there that are really quite interesting and, and I think could be exploited by better all-around opponents. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that Ray Borg just doesn't seem capable of doing. Um, he did pick up some nice takedowns along the fence. There was a f fainted flying knee into a clinch along the fence, which was an interesting way of cutting the ring on, uh, cutting the cage on Demetrius Johnson, because he's such a good mover. Um, you know, in, a, in an ideal game plan for someone like a Henry Cejudo or whatever, I would want to see the ring craft being used to get to DJ's legs, make him move differently, take him out of his A game, then hope to get his head later. Um, but yeah, Borg was admirable. I mean, he never stopped working, never stopped moving, even when Johnson was all over him on the ground, constantly isolating an arm. Um, you know, there was a sequence in the third round, I think, which just summed up why Demetrius Johnson's so good. He's just doing three things at once, working. You know, like, there's a uh, sequence in the third round, which I, I saved on my computer, so I'll, I'll put that up in the show notes too, um, which was basically he, he passed the guard immediately and he starts working on the far arm in a Kimura, uh, or starts working the far uh, far wrist to the floor for the Kimura. At the same time, he's raising the elbow on the near side with his hips, uh, and then he lets go of the far arm, uh, and Borg bucks, t uh, bucks gets the underhook and turns into him, and DJ mounts him as he's turning in. Uh, just beautiful stuff. Um, if you watch Marcelo Garcia, a, a few of the smaller guys uh, out there who are like really good um, top players, or, or like smaller guys who've done well in the Absolute Division, one of the things that you'll see quite a lot is when the guy gets the underhook from side control, they will immediately step over the body, um, whether that be to mount or to, uh, in Marcelo's case, he looks for the uh, monoplata a lot or the spiral armbar, uh, both things he was sort of a pioneer of. Um, yeah, but it was just full of sequences like that. Really impressive. And then he made the top of uh, R slash all on Reddit uh, with the finish, which was stunning you know he uh he picks him up from behind drops him and immediately jumps on the armbar uh great finish and it's really what demetrius johnson does he works the guy over and then tries to pick up the finish late um which i think is a great strategy for picking up finishes consistently um uh, you know because he is so good at putting the pace on guys and tiring them out especially as he's the only guy at flyweight who gets to fight five rounds you know none of them get a, a shot at it before they get to fight him um but and he obviously has an amazing gas tank. But I think that it's also... If people think that you... People tend to think, like, if you get the finish late, it's because you couldn't have finished it earlier. Uh, you know, if he were going wild looking for finishes, I'm sure he could finish some of these guys in, like, the second, third round. Um, but he finishes them late. And, you know, they try and sell the statistic of uh, latest submission in the UFC. But as I think it was Ben Fox pointed it out, that's not, like, an accomplishment. That means that you didn't submit the guy before that it doesn't mean like you know um it's a weird statistic to keep a track of uh on the subject of weird statistics people have been asking me about this uh title defense record and does it make him the greatest of all time firstly greatest of all time is bollocks anyway like i just can't be asked with that sort of stuff because like muhammad ali would have a horrible time against some of the heavyweights who didn't have particularly special careers. Uh, he never really liked fighting guys with really good jabs uh, and never really liked not having a reach advantage. So, like, if I put Buster Douglas in with my, uh, with Muhammad Ali, Buster Douglas, maybe on the night that he beat uh, Mike Tyson, so best bu Buster Douglas possible, he'd probably give my, uh, Muhammad Ali a much harder time than you think he would. But he's nowhere near, like, greatest of all time contention. Um, greatest of all time is, like, a... It's accomplishment, you know, some people think of it as skill, some people think of it as... It's the same with pound for pound. For some people it's accomplishment, for some people it's skill, for some people it's skill regardless of weight or scaled to weight or whatever. Like, it's, it's just a silly, silly game. But the thing is, you can either have a competitive weight class or the record for most title defences. It's not going to happen, both of them. You know, people get really upset if you, if you say anything that doesn't paint Demetrius Johnson as the outright best fighter who ever lived of all time, blah, 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 blah. But 
you know, you can look at the guys that he's been fighting in some of his title defenses, and they're not as good as some of the guys, like, in terms of rounded skill set, as good as some of the guys that you would be fighting if you were a top 10 lightweight, just regularly, um, in terms of skill. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a much thinner division. It's a much younger division. There's so many more guys available at lightweight. Um, and, you know, so it's so talent-rich and competitive um, that, you know, if you managed five, six title defences at lightweight, that would be incredible. That would be, like, you know, <laughs> greatest of all time material. Um, so, the, I mean, the number is how they're trying to sell DJ now. Um, because God knows they don't give a shit about, like, building the division further to make it better. Um, someone was pointing this out, like, someone asked me what I thought about them dropping Koji Horiguchi now. You know, he was a guy with a really bright future who's now over in Japan fighting nobodies. Um, that's sad, but then you consider... They dropped uh, Zach Makovsky. They dropped um, Ali Bagu Tinov. You know, these are good guys who were... Comp- and they dropped Tim Elliott before that, too. I mean, they're really good guys who you can't understand them not keeping around, even if it's just to fight other guys in that division. <laughs> they, for some reason, they want to, like, taper off the size of this division when really they should be getting as many fighters in there as possible and, and having them all fight each other as much as possible to bring up the level of the division. Um, very strange how they're managing it, but it's always been the Demetrius Johnson show, and for the moment, it seems to finally be working. With that being said, he looked awesome. In any Demetrius Johnson fight, there is something you can learn or steal. Uh, his use of knees is absolutely brilliant. He sets them up on the fence. He'll let the guy get up to his knees and start wall walking up, and then he'll knee him the body hard. Um, but he also uses his knees to set up other things, like he used his knee to sneak in the hook and start taking the back. Um, he'll use his knees while guard passing to the body, which I love. Uh, Shinya Aoki used to do that. He'd hit the folding pass, and then he'd bring the bring the knee in to try and take the mount, but he'd hit the guy in the chest while he was doing it. Uh, really like that. But yeah, great performance by DJ. Admirable, before, uh, admirable performance by Borg. Uh, a couple of really nice takedowns by Borg. Um, just really not at that level yet. Uh, needed some more fights before he, he got in with someone like Demetrius Johnson. But I think with guys like Joseph Benavidez and and how Henry Cejudo is coming along now. Um, and, uh, you know, Sergio, Sergio Pettis is getting there. You know, you're getting more rounded guys that you can start putting in with Demetrius Johnson. It's just that he is a few years ahead of everyone else. And in the cage, a few moves ahead of everyone else. So really solid main, uh, co-main event in terms of entertainment value. Uh, and then in the main event, you had Ferguson versus Lee, which I loved. Great fight. Um, thought Kevin Lee looked sharp on the feet in the early going. Um, thought Tony Ferguson had his usual adjustment period. He really looked to be struggling with the length of um, uh, Lee's punches. He was keeping them straight and he's got a very long reach. And he was also getting ac- across the floor a lot quicker than I'd seen him do in the past. Um, he was waiting on the kicks and throwing the right hand or the or the left hand down the center. Uh, knocked him off his feet in the very early going with that, uh, and then f- chased wildly after him. And the check hook landed and put him on his knee. Um, Ferguson did get his timing down for the check hook later on. He does that thing where he walks from one foot to the other, and then baits the guy towards him and falls back and check hooks. Um, really nice. Ferguson's kicks are worryingly telegraphed. He kicks very hard, but he does stop and then walk up into them very obviously, very rarely sets them up. I don't think I've ever seen him set them up, actually. First takedown came off a side kick, and he got caught on one leg, leaned back away from uh, from Lee's punch, counter punch, uh, and Lee just fell into the clinch and took him over. But then he almost got scrambled into bottom position for, uh, by Ferguson. He tried to roll him. Um, very impressive that he managed to stay on top. Very cool that Ferguson uh, almost rolled him there. Um, and then he, he starts, to, he caught him with his hand on the mat, even though he couldn't like take top position, uh, he he kept the overhook. Uh, started working for the Omoplata, standard Eddie Bravo stuff, um, and uh, Lee escaped it. And then once he was past guard, uh, it was all Lee. <clears throat> Beautiful top control transitions to mount ends the round, battering Ferguson from mount. Uh, it was looking very bad for Ferguson at that point. Ferguson keeps the pace of the fight quite high. Um, doesn't really lunge in as often as he uh, as he did against like uh, Edson Barbosa or Josh Thompson. Really looking for that check hook. Uh, throw some nice right front kicks to the body, particularly when uh, Lee goes southpaw, hits the Chinzo special, which is the right front kick stepping into the right jab. Um, 
Later when they hit the mat, uh, Lee doesn't get caught with his hand on the floor, which is obviously like setting up the Oma Plata path and the overhook triangle and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but this is where uh, Ferguson's elbows made the difference. I thought that was really interesting. He brings them right above his head and he just sort of arcs them in with just the arm. And, and they, they look really hard. Like They clearly co- uh, bothered Kevin Lee. I mean, he spoke about them afterwards in the post-fight interview. Um, if you watch Ferguson uh, fight from the bottom uh, in closed guard, or rather, well, it was closed guard, but he had his feet on the hips. Um, he was, you know, his his lower back was off the floor the entire time. His feet were on the hips, um, and he was planing his body slightly off to the side to bring the elbows in towards the temple. Um, you know, taking his head off line of these, uh, and Lee was uh, pushing into him and trying to stay on top of him while also trying to deal with these elbows. He starts stretching his arm out to try and obstruct the path of the elbow uh, with inside control, and that that sets him up for the armbar, uh, which he escaped quite nicely. Uh, you know, it looked very close, and he, he uh, still got out of it. Uh, Rogan went insane for that. It was Well, I went insane for that, to be fair. Uh, it was uh, it was a really tense moment. Uh, and then the, the triangle was set up the same way. It wasn't a particularly... Um, nuanced setup it was just those nice elbows raining in uh lee trying to obstruct them and then being hand pushed through for the triangle lots of people talking about him finishing on the wrong side seen some different opinions on this from um various people online um but uh i believe the last time i trained with roger gracie uh he was talking about how he likes to finish with the arm on the outside um because traditionally you're supposed to pass it over um but maybe it's because he has really long legs. I mean, Tony Ferguson has really long legs. But it is possible to finish the triangle with the with the arm on the outside. Um, I know the guy, stockier guys like Marcelo Garcia like to try and sweep from there. Um, I have to revisit my uh, my Bible on triangles, which is Ryan Hall's DVD set. Um, or actually, Neil Melanson's book is also really good too. But um, yeah, I thought that was an interesting finish. Pretty bloody good fight, though, I thought. Um, it seemed like Lee's weight cut did take a toll. You know, he had a really hard time making weight. Um, obviously, being the big, strong wrestler is important, and it really helped him in the first round. But Ferguson is a guy who really keeps a high pace. And Ferguson looks, enor- like, enormous for the weight class. Um, but he's never really... I can't remember him having trouble making weight. Um, I think it helps being, like, a gangly guy. You know, he's he's kind of um long and skinny as opposed to just gigantic um but you know he, he keeps a very high pace and he tires a lot of guys out so we better get mcgregor versus ferguson because fuck watching nate diaz versus mcgregor for a third time because nate diaz has moved himself into this position whereby you know having a victory over mcgregor and a close loss to mcgregor um, people have forgotten that, you know, against a lot of the top level uh, lightweights that he's fought, he's fallen short. And he's got a very mixed record against really high level lightweights. But frankly, like I consider Ferguson the proven best lightweight in the world. Um, the belt on him should be the real one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let, let's see what happens. Certainly they get to put two belts on the poster, which is the UFC's favourite thing. The other one that people are throwing out there is a uh, fight against Paulie Malinacci. And if you buy that, you're the worst. Like, why would you ruin the sport for everyone else? Um, just a horrible idea. So a pretty good night of fights. Um, not a lot going on this weekend except for the Rising card, which is pretty janky, if I'm honest. You just start to notice that it's the same four names over and over again. Uh, and they're not particularly experienced. They're guys with like five fights. And, you know, it would be great as prospects. But if there's nothing else on the card... You know, it's hard to give a shit. There's only so many times that I can have people tell me that Tenjin Nasakawa is the greatest striker of all time. Or will become him. Um, but he's not really fighting anyone special and he's fighting in MMA fights. So, you know, there's no no reason for him to fight anyone special. Um, anyway, let's do some plugs and then we'll do some questions. If you, are a, if you are a Patreon boy, the Rocky Marciano episode, I did say it would be up last weekend, but I've been caught up in about a thousand other things and I'm still editing it but I will definitely have it up this weekend. Um, if you want to get in on that, sign up on the Patreon. Uh, if you have not bought Notorious, The Life of Fights of Conor McGregor, it's a very good book, and it's available on Amazon and at all good retailers. Uh, and if your retailer doesn't have it, it's a shit retailer, so never ever go there again. Um, and uh, 
If you haven't bookmarked fightprimer.com, I'm still doing occasional like post-fight pieces there. I'm putting up those gifts that I said for this episode there. Um, and the new primer will be coming soon. Uh, really excited about it. GSP versus Bisping. Um, just really interesting stories and two guys who have very um, interesting approaches and have grown a lot uh, too. You know, Michael Bisping, I was watching his early fights and he's as generic as they come. Uh, and, you know, somehow he's managed to keep up with the, the young guns of the game and become a really good, well-rounded MMA striker. Very good jab and works off it well. Uh, someone was asking me whose jab I prefer, GSP or Bisping. And I think GSP's probably works better as a standalone jab. You know, he can destroy, you know, pick guys apart with the jab, but he doesn't really build off it very well with his other punches, whereas Bisping can uh, get onto the counter, you know, continue in combinations and stuff and build off it very nicely. But that's, uh, you know, that's a whole thing for the primer when we get to it. Um, right, let's do some questions. We'll go to the rapid fire thread today. Jay says, is there a mythical karate punch and does Connor have it asking for a friend? Um, there is an interesting uh, story. I think I've told it before on the podcast, but Shigeru Igami is a very interesting character. Uh, he was one of Gichin Furukoshi's first students in mainland Japan. Uh, he was obsessed with like finding the magic karate punch. Uh, allegedly took over 10,000 punches on his abdomen um, d during his life, trying to find like the, the best punch. Um, came to the conclusion that the boxers had it um, and you know had awful stomach issues in later life. Um, but his conclusion was that he didn't want to like if you're punching the body he didn't want to punch uh what's called seiken or you know the regular fist uh he wanted to punch with nakadaka ken which is if you get your fist and you raise your middle finger knuckle up and then squeeze your other fingers together around it uh just try poking yourself in the in the solar plexus with that a few times um obviously very hard to do in mma gloves or any kind of gloves but i'd be very interested to see if you could get it to work in a bare knuckle fight uh, particularly on the ground, like if you could dig that in short range, just to the ribs or whatever, um, could be very interesting. Uh, but a very interesting character nonetheless, who was in search of the mythical Zuki, uh, and thought he found an answer, probably didn't, because uh, the, the answer was sort of a cop-out, uh, and then he really badly hurt himself and his health in the process. John says, how quickly do claims of DJ being the goat go away if John Jones ever fights again? Um, I think the claims go as soon as DJ loses two. <laughs> like, you know, as soon as he's lost two fights, there'll be people who are like, well, he was the greatest, now he's not. Um, the greatest of all time thing is just bollocks anyway. Tom says, weight cutting, it's pretty daft, isn't it? Yes, we said that right at the start of the show, it's daft. Um, not really any ways around it. It seems like guys are taking more and more risks. You know, briefly that IV ban seemed to stop it for a while, but guys are now getting to the stage where they're happy to go really all out with it. Brian says, does Gary Tonin have what it takes to succeed in MMA? Um, I, I don't know if he has a striking game <laughs> that's generally needed to succeed in MMA, but, you know, um, the leg lock game is such a unique rabbit hole to go down. Um, if you aren't training with them, like, religiously, uh, you know, you can turn up to any no-gi competition nowadays, and uh, it's just guys every few matches there'll be some guy with an exploded acl if you're at like one uh, if you're at an ogi tournament that allows heel hooks guys are going crazy for them now um but gary turner is one of the best at it um but also you know he, he's not like palhares it's not his one threat well actually palhares is a great example palhares wasn't anything special as a grappler um you know before he came to the ufc then the next adcc he gets to the finals and uh you know i think galvao like edged a decision against him or something in a match where very little happened. They were both just trying to get grips and couldn't because they were both sweaty and shirtless. Um, but he got all the way to the final based on his leg locks entirely, his heel hooks. Um, so if you can control the knee and you understand the game and you're really well drilled in it, like that alone is enough to trouble a lot of dudes. But he's got a great guillotine, great back takes, um, good wrestling, which he's been working on really hard. Um, it'll be really fun to see him in MMA. But to be honest, I think I'll... If he, even if he does really well in MMA, I'll probably still enjoy watching him grapple more. It's just a funner environment where you get to, especially the, the submission only rules. Uh, there's a few guys who you just get to watch work through like clever setups where they'll concede a position or whatever to set up something else further down the road, uh, which is something you don't get to see as much in the gi or with points. Uh, and certainly in MMA where bad position means being held down and hit in the face or, you know, really short elbows and, and a points victory for that round. 
Tom says, how much of a chance do you think Rockhold would have if he were to move up in weight and try his hand at the very weak light heavyweight division? Um, who does he beat? Shogun. Uh, I mean, I, I would say he could probably beat Shogun up. Um, great wrestler. Uh, solid kicks and, and, and uh, good counter hook. You know, if you've got someone as aggressive as Shogun, watch him against OSP. Um, and he, he'll be comfortable at kicking range with Shogun. And then if he wants to take him down... Shogun's takedown defense has never been great. He's always been good at tripping guys out of the clinch, never really been good at stopping the takedowns. Uh, but I'd be interested to see who else he could beat it that way. I mean, it's not a very strong weight class. If he really feels like it, he could just go up. And he's got a built-in rivalry with the champion at his current weight. Um, it's just that I think that whole thing is going to take a while to play out especially with Robert Whittaker being like the best middleweight in the world and waiting on a shot his own title. Um, yeah, could take a while to play out. I think going to light heavyweight could actually be a really good selling point for him. Even if he just took a fight against like a top 10 guy and then came back down, you know, twiddling his thumbs until the middleweight title picture works itself out. I still want to see him against the Doom. <laughs> Darren says, with Ferguson getting rocked in a lot of his recent fights, will we see a repeat of McGregor versus Alvarez? Uh, fight of the two of them fight um i don't think i've seen him particularly badly rocked i've seen him hit a lot he's got a really hard chin and he fights really awkwardly with his head way up in the air i mean on one hand yeah he could feed mcgregor some counters on the other hand he's got a lot of tools whereas uh, eddie alvarez who i do love um but he does a lot of his best work with his hands and he does a lot of it getting close and changing levels you know uh he was a very good matchup for conor mcgregor on paper because so much of his game involves closing the distance and going to the guy and aggression and obviously he has this history of getting clipped or dropped very early in fights but then you know i've seen tony fight differently but it's never like completely different you know I well i say that but you it's still clearly the same guy with the same techniques in the fights with edson barbosa and uh, josh thompson and in the fights with rafael dos anjos and kevin lee but against dos anjos and kevin lee you can see a sort of more measured caution cautious guy taking the rounds then he starts opening up um in the Barbosa and Thompson fights, he's basically running at them. So, I mean, he clearly does understand that there's a difference between opponents and you have to react differently. It's not like we're talking about Justin Gaethje, who I think would be a really fun fight to see against McGregor because he does just cover up and move forward, which is the sort of game that really troubles McGregor if he can't get the clean counters. Um, but the the thing about Gaethje is that he really can only fight, or really only does fight the one way. Um, whereas, at least with Tony, there's a feeling that he recognises that different opponents require different um, approaches. But again, this is the whole thing. Like, Conor McGregor is unbeaten in hypothetical fights, just like Prime Anderson Silva. That's why we want to see the fights. But then that's how we sell the fights too. People desperately wanting to see Conor McGregor lose. People desperately wanting to believe that Conor McGregor is unbeatable. Um, that fight should sell very well, I hope. Vincent asks, oh hang on wait, Remy asks first, uh, who would be the most interesting matchups for Rumble in the UFC's heavyweight division? Um, any of them. I mean, Rumble had heavyweight problems at light heavyweight anyway, that sort of giving up. Um, you know, he gets snappy about it when Daniel Cormier brings it up, but we basically every fight that Rumble's lost has been his gas tank getting drained and him being put in a bad position and him sort of just going, okay, well, now it's over. He's very much a front runner, um, but that's not uncommon at heavyweight. So I wonder how much of the advantages of being a light heavyweight he'll bring up with him. You know, if you consider like the small heavyweights who've done well, like um, Fedor, Cain Velasquez and people like that, the advantage is that they can take a lick in and keep on ticking and that they really pour it on later in the fight. You know, they, they take that first burst of action, uh, which every heavyweight in the world is capable of delivering, and then they start to put together more of a, a nuanced nuanced uh, mixed martial arts game uh, on their opponent. Um, I wonder how much of that Rumble can benefit from when he basically has heavyweight traits at light heavyweight. Um, Certainly, I, I hope he has a better gas tank than some of the heavyweights, because the, the gas tank was always a, a big deal at light heavyweight too. Vincent asks, simplest way to deal with a good low kicker? Uh, easiest counters? Question mark. Simplest way, take him down. <laughs> easiest counters, uh, always too far in or too far out, ready to pull away the lead leg and then counter kick when they miss, or stepping in on them so that they feel every time they're going to throw the low kick, you're going to be on top of them before they finish it. 
Nika asks tips on flying go-go platter. My tip would be don't. <laughs> Anything like that where you're just pulling your knees up. Oh, I hate it. Actually, the one time that I do like going for the go-go platter is after picking up the leg for the Mona Plata from Mount. Um, if you can get that overhook and pick your leg up, you can start feeding that foot across the face without feeling like they're going to shatter your shin by, like, sprawling on you. Um, not your shin, sorry, your meniscus. Harry asks, letting Horiguchi go, why? Question uh, mark. Because they don't give a shit about the division. Uh, they only really give a shit about Demetrius Johnson. Uh, it seems. It seems. Juan, uh, Juan says... Are foot traps legal in MMA? And does anyone use them? Um, yeah, they're legal, but... I'm going to assume you mean treading on the foot. Um, you can see things like uh, Sakuraba used to try and pin the foot to the floor when he went for these cartwheel passes. Um, finishing single legs, it used to be a thing in uh, you know amateur wrestling. You could try and stand on their standing foot. That was uh, a Dave uh, Schultz thing. You'd think you'd see them more along the fence where the foot is there to be pinned down. Um, but I think when you're trying to trip a dude, you're really more trying, you know, you're looking to try and step and, and block their leg as opposed to so far down at their foot. Um, one of my favourite traditional martial arts applications is, uh, I believe it's the it's the uh, old Okinawan kata Seisan. Um, there's a, a weird bit where you go across the floor forwards uh, picking your foot up, putting it down, and like sh lifting your both hands up and then shoving them down. Uh, and the traditional application for it is that you step in onto someone's foot and shove them backwards and try and keep the foot pinned as they fall. Um, if you do step on someone's foot in a in a fight, you know, and hit them, there's a really good chance of them falling over. If you watch uh, Floyd Mayweather and James Tony have done this a couple of times. Um, James Tony does a beautiful one on. Uh, John Ruiz, the boring man, um, he hits him with a one-two uh, and then immediately hits like a skip step to catch uh, Ruiz's back foot. Uh, so Ruiz falls over and, and he gets points for the knockdown too, or rather he gets the knockdown awarded. I'll throw that in the show notes on fightprimer.com. Luca asks, do you think George Dillman could stop the fire and save Henry Cejudo from the injuries with his pressure points? Oh, I love George Dillman. Uh, I'm, I'm actually in the process of reading um, Prometheus, his memoir, which is just the most arrogantly named memoir I've ever heard. I'm on the part where he uh, insists that he helped Muhammad Ali beat Richard Dunn. Dominic asks, oh, this is a good one, actually. What are your thoughts on the commission letting Kevin Lee compete with a staff infection? Also, do you think Bellator kickboxing is failing and what improvements do they need to make? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's do the Kevin Lee one first. Um... Yeah, I think that was really bad of the commission. Here's the thing. As a fight fan, and as someone who fucking loved that fight, uh, I'm glad that they let it go. As someone who recognises that the commission's job is to protect the fighters, I think that was awful. Um, you know, seeing how badly some guys have been affected by stuff, like Kevin Randleman. If you, if you want to see someone really badly affected by stuff, Kevin Randleman was, like, up there among the light heavyweights, heavyweights. I mean, he, was, he always had losses, but he was always dangerous. Uh, then he was out for two years with staph infection, which put massive holes in his body. Uh, if you want to Google that, it's absolutely revolting. Uh, and then he came back and he was just a shell of his former self. Uh, and there's uh, quite a few like that, guys who've had really, really bad staph infections. Um, and of course, with the keenness of everyone to uh, over-prescribe antibiotics and the actual um, ailments getting more and more resistant to it, uh, it's, it's getting nasty and it's not looking fun for the future. Uh, someone asked me if I ever thought like, uh, you know, MRSA and, and staff and things would become so antibiotic resistant that we'd have to stop grappling. Um, could be, could be, but then you'd probably have to stop all sort of human contact. Um, it's still pretty gross that they let him go in there with a massive staff infection on his chest. I mean, you know, he's doing the thing that he, you know, he's trying to get paid and do the, the brave thing and fight, but the commissioner should be like, no, because we're putting the other guy in danger of getting a horrible skin disease. I mean, Tony Ferguson could probably sue them. But then the athletic commissions are a joke anyway. I mean, they changed the glove size. Their mandatory glove size. They waived the rule on it just so that they could sell some more tickets to the fight uh, with Mayweather McGregor. Um, they are more in the business of money than they are in the business of protecting fighters.
And then the second question was Bellator kickboxing. Bellator kickboxing, someone was telling me, like, no, Coca's doing a great job. You know, they, there's this whole fabulizing of Coca as this amazing alternative alternative um, promoter. You know, they were like, oh, but he needs to get out of revenue and build it up, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, if it's called Bellator kickboxing, what's the point in calling it Bellator kickboxing unless you're going to, you know, use the brand of Bellator to get it over? Um, anytime that you're showing your kickboxing show on a two-week tape delay, you have failed. Um, just awful. I mean, if I... If I had a magic wand and I could make Viacom see that I'm a better Scott Coker than Scott Coker could ever be, um, I would change the... I would firstly put the uh, kickbox, put some of the better kickboxing bouts on the MMA card. I would have them alternate, uh, or at least show them during the MMA card. I mean, it's on TV. Who gives a shit? Um, but, you know, or, you know, in the breaks between fights, like if you get a fast knockout, show one of the kickboxing matches or something like that. But... Uh, five minute rounds for the kickboxing match three three five minute rounds I would have for the standard kickboxing match uh, if you really want to go out there put them in gloves you're calling it Bellator kickboxing make it Bellator but kickboxing because um, at the moment they're paying guys like Raymond Daniels and Joe Schilling 30 grand 50 grand a fight and nobody's seeing it I've got it queued up to watch forgot about it because I've waited two weeks to get it now I don't give a shit kickboxing is basically dying uh, and Scott Coker has bought up some of the better fighters and is doing nothing useful with them Right, running out of time now, uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, if you want to send an email to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. Sign up to the Patreon to get the Rocky Marciano episode this week uh, by Notorious because it's a fun read. Um, and head to Fight Primer at some point this week, and I'll probably put up something new for you. In fact, the show notes will be there with some gifts in. Uh, I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Uh, enjoy Rising this weekend if you watch it I probably won't, I might watch the highlights afterwards or something uh, and then we'll start talking about the Donald Cerrone, Darren Till fight next week which I'm really excited about also props to the UFC for not subtitling Darren Till on that promo even though I could understand someone not understanding a word he says he's lived in Brazil for like several years and he's still got this really strong accent anyway, I'm your boy Jack Slack this has been the Fights Gone By podcast, and I'll catch you next week. Connor bless.